before we go into our interview today, I wanted to let everyone know we have a new sponsor for our Energy Question podcast, the U.S. Oil and Gas Association, or USOGA for short. First established in 1917, USOGA has been an effective and creative voice for the industry for more than a century now. USOGA is dedicated to educating the public, policymakers, and legislators at the federal, state, and local levels about the value of the domestic oil and natural gas industry. If you're in the industry and not currently a USOGA member, please consider joining the association as a way of helping it tell your story to the policymakers whose actions impact everything you do each and every day. You can start that process by contacting USOGA through its website, usoga.org. Thanks so much to USOGA for sponsoring the Energy Question podcast, and now on with our show. Hey, welcome to the Energy Question with David Blackman. I'm your host, David Blackman. By now, I think you've all figured that out. My special guest today is a, is a friend of this show who's been on several times in the past, Tom Pyle, the president of the Institute for Energy Research, one of the foremost energy think tanks uh, based in Washington, D.C. Tom, how you doing? I'm doing really well. I'm really positive here on the eve of the COP28 summit in, uh, <laughs> in the Middle East. So I'm more yeah. optimistic than I've been in a really long time. You know, I, I'm getting the same feeling, frankly. I And for, for those viewers, I mean, this will be published probably in the midst of the COP conference, uh, but we're recording it the day before it all kicks off. And um, my gosh, I... <sighs> What do you think they're going to accomplish, Tom, uh, in uh, where are they meeting Dubai? Well, uh, I think this conference. Yeah, the first week is usually a lot of parties. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of carbon went flying in the atmosphere to get everyone there. Yep. Right. So take that. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if we're going to see the preeminent carnival barker, Al Jazeera Gore. I'm not sure reference. either. We've already seen John Kerry. Yeah. Uh, Al Gore, he's a special, special case, that one. Um, he, You know how much money he's made off of his climate alarmism? Like $300 hunt, million, hunt, dollars, isn't it? Hunt north of $300 million, yes. Wow. Not too bad, right? Not yes, too bad. Uh, and it's such a big, huge scam, you know, the whole thing. Well, it's worse than that. It's hypocrisy, like, to the max, right? I mean, that's the challenge or the, or the frustration I have with all of this. At least Bill Gates has some honesty, right? Every once in a while he says something and then he's like, oh, I'm going to get in trouble for that. Uh, in a conference in the New York Times recently, he announced that his offsets, his carbon offsets, his personal carbon offsets are $10 million a year. Yeah. So he writes checks to these obscure organizations that supposedly offset his carbon footprint that's a pretty yeah. I, I would just like that a year period or my career no or my kidding. life right yeah. so I mean, but Al Gore, of, yeah, he's oh. a special case because he and i don't understand why people are still listening to this guy i really i'm don't. not sure who does still listen to him do you think people still well, do listen to him i'm not sure the axiosis of the world well, well, uh, yeah. you know politico they report his his you know barker you know carnival barking as gospel yeah. uh, in, a lot of, in a lot of cases you know so maybe it's not that important because who lives who reads and <laughs> listens to that stuff but so yeah al gore is uh apparently president joe biden is not going to make it uh it i don't think it gives him enough time to get to delaware and back for a couple of vacations right. in between. <laughs> yeah. so but but the vp is on the way She's oh gonna thank god a. yes and of course special k uh, special yes. envoy, special envoy Kerry uh, will be there uh, representing the United States. And in the primary objective of all of these, uh, I, I said there's a lot of parties the first week. The first week is also when historically countries like China, um, other like India, others secure oil and coal deals with other nations. Yes. It happens usually in the first week, right? Yep. Um, and you know, who can blame them? They want to provide electricity for their, for their citizens. Of they course. want their citizens not to have to scrub the bush <laughs> to gather sticks so that they can heat their homes or cook their food. Right. I don't blame them at all. 
Um, the other thing that usually happens at these is that other countries who feel they're entitled to um, money uh, spend a lot of time talking to countries like the United States and, and France, some European countries, and and suggest to them that they ought to fork over billions of dollars. Billions and billions of dollars. The latest, I think, now is they're even asking for climate reparations because right. that word is all in in vogue right now. So, and that's trillions and trillions of dollars they're yeah, seeking yeah. under that rubric. Of course, um, there's all kinds of like oh suspense, and then like oh they're so close to a deal, and then oh they work through the night and they come up with these predictions, and then China doesn't agree to anything. India doesn't agree to anything. And everyone goes home and gets ready to party next year. And starts building, and then, you know, ramps back up their plans to build more coal plants, right? Yeah. So, I yeah, mean, it's kind of, it's actually charged. rivaling now Davos in both its absurdity and uh, its hypocrisy. Yeah. So, so anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's that deal. Uh, yeah. <laughs> another year, know, another I, cop. Uh, so. I, I saw, uh, that Germany's, uh, you talk about the the climate pledges that uh, that the developing nations always demand from the developed nations. And Germany today, uh, right before we recorded this, announced they're going to give a hundred million dollars to the the hundred billion dollar climate fund. Right. So that's Germany's contribution. But the, but the expectation, of course, that the vast majority of that money will come from one country, the United States of America, and. This administration, such a bunch of dupes, that probably is what's going to happen, don't you think? Well, they'll attempt to and they'll um, reprogram some defense dollars and do some other stuff. But by and large, uh, they're going to need Congress to appropriate all of that. Right. Thankfully, we have a House of Representatives that has some sense of sanity. Uh, sometimes, yes. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes when, they fly off the rails, but true. Uh, <laughs> but I, I suspect that they'll have a tough time getting, you know, actual uh, person, you know, get, getting Congress to fork up that kind of money. And I hope yeah. that they don't, quite honestly, because all this is is a tried and true 50 year desire by the progressives or whatever they called themselves back in the Warren Harding days of of trying to redistribute wealth there it's all a, it, at its very core it is wealth it is the wealth of the club of rome and the sort of wealth redistribution agenda packaged up in you know we got to save the planet right yeah. like if they really wanted to save the planet instead of forking out billions of dollars and giving it to very profitable companies like automobile companies or international uh, or foreign based wind companies which our government is doing right now they would spend that money and have the defense department build nuclear plants on defense facilities in let's say the presidio in san francisco in nancy pelosi's backyard and they could generate say 18 to 20 new uh nuclear reactors about the size of the vogel plant uh, that's gone online in georgia yeah and that would put bring the nuclear uh electricity generation from 19 percent now to sort of sort of in the 25 to 30 percent range that's emission free carbon dioxide but that's not what and they're safe doing. And, and yeah. extremely safe Roger. they're using the def no they're using the defense production act which was designed to encourage production of things that are needed to win wars to give to manufacturers of heat pumps. Heat pumps. <laughs> so do I, uh, General George S. Patton is rolling over in his grave right now, <laughs> right? I mean, God, I wish he was around. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is what our government is doing right now. Right now, they're they're doing silly, stupid things like pretending that uh, we're at at war with carbon dioxide or fossil fuel generation you, you, you so and, and that dpa authorization to me was uh a really significant event i think it's been downplayed by the media it hadn't been reported a lot but uh I, I i wonder if you agree i see this as kind of a a, a throwing out a trial balloon camel's nose under the tent to declaring a full-fledged climate emergency during the campaign next year 
uh, which, you know, the activists have really been pounding on Biden to do that already. Uh, do you think that's what this is, kind of the camel's nose under the tent for that move? Oh, I I I think all these moves are designed to to help try to help him get himself in a position to deliver something uh, significant to the progressives, the the environmental left, the Greens. You have to understand your your listeners, our audience has to understand that the environmental movement you and I grew up with is not what it is now. No, oh, yeah, no. It used they used to have specific causes and they used to care about specific things. They used to actually do good things, right? To some, to extent. some extent. You know, there there are some, yes, absolutely. Uh, especially locally based, right? Right. I mean, where I for where I where I spend a bunch of my time, I participate in the in the creek cleanups every, you know, every now and then and stuff like that. What it is now is a is literally an ar- a political and an organizational and money arm of the Democratic Party. It's an apparatus, yep. and they've they've reoriented their entire movement around the word climate, because climate can mean anything to anybody, and can be molded and shaped in any way, shape, or form. And the part that irks me the most is that climate can be blamed for all of the really bad, stupid policies that they promote in other areas, like wilderness and wildlife, wildfire management, like uh, development, right? Like mining, like everything else that they screw up um, and and has these impacts. Then they say, oh, it's the climate. It's climate change. See, this is more the more reason why we have to double down on these stupid, ignorant policies that do nothing for the environment, but help them satisfy their goal. And I don't know where it stems from. I don't know where it was born. Maybe it's the, you know, uh, John D. Rockefeller sort of, you know, hangover. But like these environmentalists just hate oil and natural gas and coal. It's weird. It's a fixation. It it is. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a religious exercise more than anything else. And uh, I mean, and I think there's no denying. In fact, uh, Al Gore has even admitted that uh, and, and urged advocates to to talk about these things in religious terms uh, because he thinks that has a, a larger impact on the public. I, you know, I, I, I just think that's what it is. These are mainly people who don't have real religion. So it's kind of a substitute for that. And, and, and it that, gives their lives meaning. That is a. Unfortunately, I think that is a symptom of of this sort of hyperdrive towards secularism and the sort of this anti-religious bend as well yeah. in, within the left. But the sad part is, is that um, all of this money is being wasted. It's all being wasted. You know, when when did the Democratic Party, who who claimed to care so much about the folks, the peeps, <laughs> you know, when did they become the party that shovels hundreds of millions if not billions of dollars into wickedly profitable companies like yeah. General Motors and Ford and Gamesa and and Orsted and you know some of these co- companies aren't even American companies and that they're handing the money that we pull out of our pocket reluctantly hopefully and send to Washington and redistributing it to large profitable corporations. Right. That's, and, that's and what they're Ford, doing. Yeah. And Ford and GM are very lucky right now, aren't they, to have fossil fuel automobile divisions that are highly profitable to offset all the massive losses they're sustaining now in their electric vehicle divisions. Right? Yeah. Let, let me give you a couple of numbers. Ford, their EV division reported a loss of $1.3 billion in the third quarter of this just year. Just the third quarter. <laughs> just one quarter. <laughs> and all the subsidies that we're giving them, the loan guarantees that we're giving them f- to prop up the EV business, H- Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's shop, just sold eight hundred and fifty million dollars worth of GM stock. And just today, in the Wall Street Journal, GM said, "You know what? We're slowing way down on our EV investments. You know why? Because customers don't want them." Right? Duh. <laughs> I wonder what tipped them off. <laughs> They're piling up at the dealerships. The 4,000 dealerships just wrote a letter. 
4,000, many of which are in the states that are trying to ban uh, gas powered yeah. cars like California and others telling Joe Biden, put, put the brakes on this agenda because it cars are piling up at our dealerships. You're forcing the automobile companies to send them to the dealerships. I can't offload them. I I've been in the market for a car because, you know, fortunately no one was hurt. We had a little fender bender with the, uh, with the car that I had before. And it's a tough market out there. It is, man. We, we've had to do it this year, too. And boy, it is. And I can look. I've done really well. I've worked hard. I've done well. I'm not loaded. I'm not rich. I got three kids. I still got to put through college. We <laughs> struggle, but I can afford a car, right? I can afford a car. What about the people who can't? Right. What about the people who are right on that line? What about the people who are paying 21% more for their electricity under Joe Biden? than president trump what about the people who are you know in a position where they they can't buy a new car because the market is so messed up because of what government is doing to the market how government is interfering in the market in the way that they are and manipulating the 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 sort of types of cars that we we have the ability or, or uh, afford can afford for this agenda like you said for this religious agenda and the ev is almost like the cross Right. For this crowd. Yeah. yeah. Right. Hey, I've in fact, I've got something for you guys at IER. Yeah, shoot. Because I, I'm not a deep enough thinker to do it right. But it appears to me that the government intercession into the automobile market in the United States is having the exact same effect on the cost of automobiles that government interference in the medical business beginning in the late 1950s or early 60s. Um, has had on our healthcare costs in this country. And I think it would be a really ripe topic for some real research and commentary. Now, yeah, I don't know if y'all want to, to do that, but I'm not smart enough to go I, back and do all the research and, and all the reasoning. I, I have it. spent the bulk of my life studiously trying to avoid waiting in the healthcare debate. Yeah. But I can give it to my policy guys because I just send it to them and say, here, make me look smart. Right. I mean, you're right. I mean, honestly, like I, I do know a little bit about it, David, and you're probably thinking about what I'm thinking about is how they they manipulated the tax code in such a way that it was right. impossible to give people wages. So companies began giving them benefits like health benefits. Right. And so right. then you had this employer based health care program that emerged out of dumb government policies. And then once that was in place. All of the, you know, the changes that have taken place where the, the government, progressive, the left, Democrats generally more so now than I think there were some reasonable ones back when you and I were young whippersnappers. Yeah, just 20 years ago, even, you know, the, I mean, the Democrats, Democrats today, you could work with. three things that they want to control. Health care, education and energy. Yeah, that's it. Those are the that those are the rings. Those are the three, those are the three, the three gold rings. If you control one, two, and three of those, you got total, practically total control over the economy. And what's the reason for that? Those are three things everyone has to have yep. to survive in life, right? To to prosper in life. You have that's to have right. those three things. So that's why they they focus so heavily on controlling those three things. Yeah. I mean. Again, not not necessarily my expertise, but there are certainly some complaints among parents about the public education system in America today. Uh, oh, and, yeah. and, and and the higher education, which, by the way, President Obama was successful in us taking control of the student loan program. <laughs> how, how did Amazing. that help anything? Com completely contrary to all the court decisions and the law. Yeah. All that did was increase the cost of education and also um, empower universities to do the, the 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 woke thing that they're doing these days, right? Where these kids yeah. are shouting, you know, shouting really nasty stuff about Israel and stuff like that. So it's a mess. And we we at the Institute and especially the Alliance, because that's our advocacy arm, the American Energy Alliance. I've been at I've been at IR for 16 years now. Can you believe that? God, we, have man, time fought, flies. <laughs> we have fought these battles since 2007, 8. 
to try to, it. And it's very simple. It's freedom and free markets versus power and control and, and, and government intervention. Yeah. It's just simple. It's two worldviews. And historically and throughout time, time and time again, free markets, freedom, uh, you know, that has always been the winner. It's always been more profitable for people, more pro enables people to pursue their happiness and their prosperity and results in better outcomes across the board. Right. No doubt. Yeah. Always, always. And that's, there are no exceptions to that, that I can think of actually. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, we, and, and another part of this transition is the wind industry. You mentioned all this money that's going to these foreign countries, Siemens, Gamesa, Orsted, uh, to facilitate Biden's offshore wind program, which is failing. I mean, it's it's massively failing at this point. Uh, is there any reason, is there any compelling reason? And this is the question, to me, it always comes down to with offshore wind. I mean, I can see some rationale for onshore wind, although it's very slim. But is there any real logical economic rationale why offshore wind should even exist in the first place. At the because moment, no. Yeah, I mean, there's so many better, more efficient options, right? At the moment, no. And the interesting thing about all of this is the government can be very efficient when it, it is in pursuit of its desires or wants, right? Look at the way that they're treating oil and gas versus wind offshore. Yeah. Look at how they're fast tracking permits for offshore wind. And then when they get the permits and they get to the point where they're ready to, uh, you know, pull the trigger or dig some dirt. The economics became so bad for Orsted, for example, that they pulled the plug in New Jersey and took a write off. And then the governor got all had all egg all over <laughs> his face. So, you know what he did? It's like, well, I got to, you know, do something now. So then he went and turned around and put New Jersey into the California program right. for, for banning um, gas powered cars in, in New Jersey. Right. Yep. yep. It's like it's insanity. So, look, will there it, is there a market for offshore wind? There will be if there is demand, there's economic, you know, the economics make sense. Right. That's the that should be the measure. And not even artificially. When the, even when the economics makes sense, isn't isn't modular nuclear a more sensible option? Uh, if you're talking I mean, about CO2 emissions, sure. Absolutely. Yeah, right? Yeah. Absolutely. And we have a nuclear regulatory commission who is stuck in the 50s and has, you know, no desire whatsoever to innovate and yeah. has basically put their, you know, put put a roadblock on any new developments in nuclear nuclear power generation you know i think it should be a prerequisite that if you are a candidate for the nuclear regulatory commission that you should be in support of nuclear power we actually have can commissioners who are against nuclear power yeah, where do you think the they're going to land on all this stuff <laughs> it's so. insane it's but insane. here let's, let me go back to the economics part yeah. Right. Oh, yes, yes. I interrupted you there. So. No, it's okay. I just want to like clarify. Like, we've we've known forever that we had oil in the Bakken. I mean, we used to get these emails like, "There's so much oil in the Bakken." Oh my right. God! You know how much oil there is in the Bakken? We never had the technology or the economics to get it out, and then those things happen, and now we're act. You know, ten, fifteen years later, or twelve years later, it's like. It's like as if we never even knew that there wasn't oil in the bot. Like we didn't, you know what I'm saying? Do you understand what I mean? Like yes. technology, e economics, availability of resources. And then in the United States, of course, the, the other factor is property rights, right? We, we own the subsurface. If we own exactly. the land, we own the subsurface. We have skin in the game. We profit from it. In other places uh, in the world where they have shale, they don't have the property rights and the crown in case of UK or wherever there. So what incentive do these citizens have of, of wanting someone to come on their property and drill a hole in their, you know, in their backyard or whatever. Right. Right? So, uh, so yeah, we do it right here. We just got to preserve it. 
we have to fight hard to preserve the values, the the the, the system of of law, uh, you know, the the stuff that make has made America great um, is in jeopardy every time we we get, go down this road of telling us what kind of stoves we can buy or what kind of heat you know how to heat our homes and what cars we can drive and what electricity choices we have the avail availability to to utilize it i got i get frustrated because it's expensive and it's a waste right that incredible waste yes i'm now so you uh oh go ahead go ahead no you go well you were on the the first trump transmission uh tr tr transition team if you excuse me I yeah use the right word here um and and saw all the all the and, and helped make the revolution come about in the early months of that that first trump term in terms of of changing the landscape where energy policy is concerned and i wonder i just wrote a story about this myself kind of analyzing what all the roadblocks the difficulties to repeating that might be if he should win next year but I wonder what your view is. It, it would if 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 Trump should be successful, and and win a second term in twenty twenty four, do you think there's a there would be an opportunity for him to create the same kind of rapid rebalancing of our energy policy in the United States? Yeah, I think so. Um, we're involved in an in effort called Project Twenty Twenty Five. I don't know if you've heard of this. I haven't. No, no. Yeah, it's. It's largely because they're the big dog in D.C. They've got a lot of resources it's been spearheaded by the infrastructure has been provided by the Heritage Foundation. But there are north of 100 and something groups in this project. And we've got about three or four things that we're trying to achieve. The first is day one. Day day one to sort of 100. Right. What should the uh, the next conservative president do? Uh, um when he's sworn in for the, you know, all the executive orders and the rules and everything. Right. right? And then the second component is the, the whole four year term, like what long term short mid to long, long term things can the administration do without Congress? And then of course, assuming the makeup of Congress, what can they do with Congress? And then uh, the third component is uh, personnel. And this is huge, right? right? You're only as good as your people. Right. So you might have to move to Washington, David, for a few years Not me. <laughs> and run the interior department or run, the, you know. Um, oh, I might do it for that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> or at least be deaf. Come on. Deputy is a pretty good deal. Number two. Yeah, no kidding. Pretty yeah. good. They got to put some, you know, fancy politician in the in the top spot. So. Exactly. Yeah. But anyway, the point is, is that we're building a database of personnel and we're vetting people based on ability, talents, uh, ideology and where sort of they should fit in in a in a new conservative administration. It's not for President Trump. It's not a sort of foregone conclusion. But you know, uh, it's you read the tea leaves. He certainly has the momentum. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's one thing. The other thing, though, is is and this is what I lament about this process, right? Because I've been here for for a while and I've watched it and I've been part of it when I worked on the Hill. Um for leadership for Mr. DeLay, we had Bill Clinton in, in the White House. And then, you know, I transitioned to the private sector, or, you know, about a year into Bush's presidency. We've had this whipsaw, you know, for the, for the, this is the, the only time that the, that the, the Congress has flipped back and forth as rapidly year cycle over cycle um, it was the period in the run up to, and during the civil war. So I can leave that for, you know, philosophical conversation uh in terms of the the sort of turmoil uh that's going on in this country yeah. sort of us versus them and the red versus blue and everything but the point is is that when you have this constant churning of power who controls the levers of power you get this whipsaw right so we had bush who did some good things he did some bad things like he gave us rfs gave yes. us the ethanol mandate um you know that kind of stuff then you had Obama, who started this whole process, right? Who started this whole madness with EVs, uh, who did the whole like, OK, well, if we can't regulate them through carbon taxes and others, then let's, you know, 
give them uh, money, give them resources, right? The the Obama stimulus was all the green stuff. That that kind of started that ball rolling. And all the regulations he put on, on oil and gas production. And then we had Trump who came along and helped us undo that. But then the challenge there is you have to spend the first one or two years of your presidency undoing the stuff that the guy did that before you did. Right. So how much time do you have left to move for, move the ball forward? So I always advocate for Congress getting involved in this process and this reasserting themselves in the legislative and the, and the process between the, the checks and balances of government, because I think the executive is too powerful regardless of who's in the white house. That's my well, I do too. I, absolutely. I mean, and that's part of the whipsawing effect we see. It's because you have instead of a, a a president, you know, issuing maybe twenty or thirty executive orders throughout their their first term in office, there's twenty or thirty on the first day, yeah, and a thousand the first year, and uh, and so it becomes a, you know, a a real radical kind of change every time you elect a new president. Yeah, and the and the you know the rulemaking process is not. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. There's a long sort of, you know, Administrative Procedures Act type process that you have to follow in order to get something finalized. And then once you do that, you got all the lawsuits and everything else and, you know, so on and so forth. So what I advocate for is making structural changes in the way we govern. And that involves Congress. Like, for example, we've been stonewalled left and right uh, at U.S. Treasury, IRS, FERC on all of our FOIA work, our Freedom of Information Act work. Uh, we file a FOIA request, a Freedom of Informa Information Act request, because we want to know what these agencies are doing and who's influencing them and how they're making their decisions that are affecting our lives. Well, that is the job of traditionally the job of the media, which they've completely you know abdicated uh, over the years. And and what happens is is that you know you file a FOIA request on January first. We don't even get information until March or April, and then that, at that point. Everything's blacked out. Then we got to go go to the courts. Then that takes another three months. Maybe we'll get something meaningful by like fall, yeah. right? So Congress needs to fix that. Congress needs to fix the regulatory process. They need to re basically re rearrange and, and stop giving all this power and authority to the regulators. In a lot of ways, that's a, a, a scapegoat for them because right. they can say, well, EPA is out of, out of control. Well, it's all those bad people at Interior. You rein them in then. That's your job. Right. 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 So Congress needs yeah. to get involved in this. And otherwise, it's not going to end. And I, and I applaud the new speaker. I don't know how long he'll be there. Uh, <laughs> speaker Johnson. I hope it's longer than 10 months. <laughs> yeah, he's great. Uh, he's got a great staff. One of them is one of my alumni, quite frankly. Um, and he, what he wants to do is kind of get us back to regular order, right? Get us back right, to where yes. Congress was legislating again. Give yeah, the subcommittees, yeah. the full committees, the ability to cut deals and make things happen and grease, you know, for lack of a better term, the, the legislative process to get stuff, stuff stuff passed meaningfully instead of six dudes and, and gentlemen and ladies sitting around in a room and making all the decisions for everybody else. What's the point of being an elected official if you have no power or no control in the process? Exactly. I, I mean, it's got to be the most frustrating job in the world to be a member of Congress right now. Yeah, you, and that's why you have completely a ab abdicated what you're supposed to be there to do. Yeah, and yeah. that's why there's a wave of retirements taking yeah. place right now in both yeah. parties. And some really good folks, too. Debbie yeah. Lesko, uh, Bill Johnson in Ohio, some of these folks who are really sharp, really understand what we talk about in, in the importance of energy and freedom and all that good stuff. They're out of there. They're like, I, just, I can yeah. go be more productive, right? So, yeah. Some good folks. I, I can't say I'm going to miss Ken Buck, but uh, yeah, <laughs> a lot of those retiring are, are really good folks. Listen, man, we're going to have to cut this off. I, I We need to do this more often. These these episodes with you are the best. I mean, they're just so great because we just have a conversation, you know, and it, it, it just flows so well. And I really appreciate you taking the time. Before we go, let everyone know how they get in touch with IER, AEA and support you guys and what you yeah, let me give let me do three quick plugs institute for energy research.org as soon as you log in there'll be a, like an obnoxious sign up for your for us thing do it because it will give you good information oh man you can, yeah you can always hit delete on stuff if you know we don't spam you 
AmericanEnergyAlliance.org is uh, our C4, our advocacy arm. And then the last thing I want to plug, SaveCars.org. This is a brand new coalition that we formed. There's four, nearly 40 national and state-based organizations now that have joined SaveCars.org. And the goal is very simple, to preserve the ability for you to choose the type of car or truck that best suits your needs not what the government imposes on you. And that's our that, mission that, at safecars.org. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's a noble goal. I hope you're able to succeed with it. You know, the, obviously the Biden administration doesn't want you to succeed at that, uh, which is just shameful, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, and, and thanks to U.S. Oil and Gas Association for being our sponsor, Eric Perel, our extraordinary producer, and to the Sandstone Group and Stu Turley for hosting our podcast. I'm David Blackman with Tom Pyle, and that's all for now.